Okay, everybody, welcome to today's show. I have Doug Casey here. He is live from Uruguay, a country many people forget, but you shouldn't in South America. He is a well-known author. He is a, I would say, a revolutionary thinker, an economist, best-selling. Uh, he, he wrote a book that sold over, oh, I think, a half a million copies in the 1980s talking about his worldview, some people say this would be a financial libertarian, but he calls himself an anarcho-capitalist. Anarchy meets capitalism. And so we're going to be covering on today's show the case for being outside the U.S. Africa, we'll talk about. We'll talk about Argentina maybe being the best place in the world when you consider cost of living and living in a, in a nice place. Thailand, we're talking about uh, should all drugs be legalized to get rid of the profit incentive? We'll be talking about Scandinavia. We'll be talking about also something interesting, which is, you know, what do you buy when you start to make money? Do you buy gold? Do you buy Bitcoin? Do you buy Monero? Where do you store it? All these are coming on the show and more. Doug, thanks for being here. Pleasure time. Absolutely. Okay. How are you, Doug? Can you hear me okay? I'm speaking to you from um, Uruguay, close to Punta del Este on a farm, but I can hear you perfectly. Well, that's great. I've been to Montevideo and all around Uruguay. At one point, I lived with the Amish for two and a half years after Joel Salatin, who introduced us. Um, I was Joel Salatin's, one of his first apprentice. So yeah, I lived with Joel Salatin and and. Then when I went to the Amish, they wanted to look at farmland in South America. So I went down all over Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, and we went into Uruguay. A lot of sheep and cattle there. Yes, it's farm country. Um, where I am is close to the beach resort of Punta del Este, which is very jet setty. Yes. Uh, but um, I would have looked at Paraguay, too, while you were down here. There's yeah, lots and lots of, you know, have you been there? We went there. That's kind of like the Wild West of that area. It's a little more. <clears throat> yeah, I kind of like Paraguay. But um, so what did you decide? Are you going to make the jump or not? Well, this was this was a long time ago. I w went to Joel Salton when I was a teenager. And then I went with the Amish and we spent about three, four months. We covered 5,000 miles across South America. And they finally decided stay in Virginia. That was <laughs> that was the that was the final decision at that time do you know who alan nation is no so that was kind of joel salatin's mentor he was the editor of a magazine and he told me before he was he was kind of joel's farm mentor now joel he died and joel took over his magazine but when i went with joel uh, when i went with the amish alan said before you go i've been i travel a hundred thousand miles a year looking at farmland he said the best farmland for the money is in the United States. So that might be a good segue for our conversation. I want to introduce everybody to our guest today, uh, Doug Casey. You may have heard of him, you may have seen him online. He's a, we could say financial libertarian. I'll let you correct me if that's not the right way to say it, but you're- well, that, would you, be, that, would, that would be correct, but I would say I define myself as an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, okay. Better known as ANCAPs in today's world. Believe it or not, my mom is one. She just went down to Anarca, I think it's called Anarcapulco in Mexico this February. So my mom's super into that world. She's introduced me to it. And so I've seen your stuff online. And, you know, I know by background, you wrote one of the best selling books going back in the 1980s on, you know, the coming financial crises in the world. So I, I'm very thankful you took the time to to come on the, the call. And I, I got some interesting things I want to get your opinion on. Okay. Yes, and Arcapulco is run by an old friend of mine named Jeff Berwick. Yes. Uh, with a newsletter called The Dollar Vigilante. So uh, yeah, by all means. Yeah, I think one of the first questions I had for somebody who's listening and 
you know, I have a lot of unconventional followers. They're entrepreneurs. I have a big following in the United States, but also globally. A lot of people are shocked when they hear that Americans want to leave because America has been very good at marketing itself as the place to be. And so many entrepreneurs from now in the world ask me, Ty, how do I get, you know, get into the U.S., get a foot in in Los Angeles and New York? And I tell them, well, a lot of entrepreneurs are headed the other direction. What do you think are the three kind of highly specific reasons that somebody listening might want to rethink their view of the supremacy of the United States as a place to make money, but also to live and raise a family and for the coming future, whatever might that be? What's kind of three pointed things that you think are a good case for someone like you living outside the United States or digital nomads that maybe you don't want to be, that the U.S. isn't as... <laughs> Is it is it well, much more of a crisis than people think? Right. Well, <clears throat> I've been to 160 countries. Wow. And okay. lived in 10. Um, and I've basically made a living um, out of investing internationally and talking about the international situation in addition. So why would anybody want to leave the U.S.? <clears throat> Look, the U.S. has turned into just another of the 200 plus countries that cover the world like a skin disease at this point. Um, America is an idea and America is different than the U.S. Uh, the U.S. The U.S. has actually turned into a global empire uh, internationally and domestically. It's turned into a a domestic multicultural empire. And there are a lot of advantages to living in the U.S., no question. It's um, the cost of living is relatively cheap. It's very convenient. Everything works. But from a uh, personal freedom point of view, the U.S. has been going in the wrong direction for many years. And the process is accelerating at this point. Uh, it's actually turning into a police state. So that uh, I find that living in a foreign country, and we can talk about lots of different foreign countries, and it depends on what you want, you can actually have a lot more freedom and more financial opportunity uh, outside of the U.S. than in the U.S. I mean, for younger people, I even suggest they go to Africa, uh, hmm. which most people would never countenance or even think of. So uh, where do you want to start? So let's, ta let's take that. Let's go down that rabbit hole because Africa is certainly an up and coming entrepreneurial locale. I mean, I have followers, a lot of e-com people and you just see it. And I, I was actually giving a talk the other day and I said, if you're an entrepreneur in the Western world, watch out because you have all these smart people in Africa. They now have access to high-speed internet and for them making three grand a month, with the cost of living is, you know, very motivating and they're becoming good. So I want to hear your perspective. Why might somebody want to base their themselves out of Europe, out of America, instead in Africa? What's what's the what's the pros and cons you see? Well, I'm not a believer in a level playing field. I like to go places where the odds are tilted in my favor. <laughs> and I have a I like that. Okay. If you go to Africa as, as an American or a European, it'll be unusual because it doesn't get a lot of foreigners. Not a lot of white guys go to Africa. Uh, in fact, uh, the white man is being driven from Africa actively in many countries, South Africa in particular. Uh, so that's number one. You're unusual. People want to meet you because you're unusual. Mm. Number two, by virtue of having grown up in an advanced society, you're going to have a lot of connections and a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience that the locals don't have. Mm. And uh, that's another big plus. Uh, look, I can go to almost any African country at this point, spend a week there, 
and have a good prospect of sitting down with the uh, president of the country, believe it or not. It's not, not too hard. Uh, it's not too hard to meet people. If, if, if you're the exotic foreigner, first thing I always do is call up local real estate agents because I'll talk to anybody, especially who might have money and might be willing to buy something, and lawyers uh, who will give anybody an interview. You might be a client, especially if you appear to be a rich foreigner. And uh, you get after you interview these two types, uh, if you get along with them, you get introduced to their buddies, you go to parties, one thing leads to another. Um, I go to art galleries. That's where rich people hang out too. And if you're going to act as an entrepreneur in one of these countries, you want to run with the top of society, not the bottom. I mean, running with the lower classes anywhere uh, will get you nowhere, uh, whether it's in the United States or in Africa. There's just a lot more in the lower classes in Africa. Uh, I go to the polo clubs. I played polo for many years. And it's a, an international fraternity. So you show up at the local polo club, and you're already one of the boys uh, mm. with the wealthiest, most powerful people in the country, typically. So it's not hard to do. Uh, trouble with Africa, uh, a few things work there. Uh, so it's a question of acting as, an, as a political entrepreneur in many ways. And my hobby for many years has been going to backward countries and uh, presenting them with a plan to um, radically transform their, their societies. But that's just something that I do. It's not something that's suitable for anybody, everybody. So, so Africa, where would be a country, what would be on the to to go list you recommend and to stay away from what where in africa would you suggest someone start who wants to experiment with this is it in south africa are we talking northern you know africa egypt are we where are we and where are we staying away from in your opinion right well you've got about 55 56 countries something like that in africa and they're all quite different from each other so if you're a newbie and you've never been to Africa before, sure, I guess the easiest thing is to get on a plane to Johannesburg and take a look at South Africa. But I'm not sure that that's where you want to go when it comes to looking for opportunities. Because mm. um, they're already about, there are about 4 million white people there. They've got significant racial problems. Now, I'd go someplace where nobody goes. Uh, so if you want to go to Southern Africa, I'd look at Namibia. Hmm. Very interesting place. Not dangerous. South Africa is dangerous uh, in the big cities, quite frankly. You've got to be careful where you go. Uh, if you speak Portuguese, uh, you might go to Mozambique. Um, hmm. Where to go so you don't jump in? You don't want to jump in on the deep end of the pool if you can avoid it. Ghana, an English-speaking country, relatively advanced. That might be a good place to start. But, you know, and the thing is, is that Americans tend to be very provincial. <clears throat> we make up about 4% of the world's population, but we think that the whole world is within the U.S. And, right. And it's not. So if you haven't been out of the country before, it's probably a mistake to start with Africa. You've got to right. take these things on a gradient. I mean, go to Europe, take the Eurail around, see some countries, uh, go to South America. It depends on how old you are, too. Look, uh, it's getting harder and harder to do this type of thing. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when, if you're a young person, the perfect thing to do would be to get a backpack and backpack and hitchhike from whatever country it might be. But um, you need the experience to start with. Because if you're going to be an entrepreneur in a foreign country, you've got to have something to offer the locals. Right. I mean, you can't just show up there without knowledge and capital and connections. If you yeah. like those things, eh, maybe you should stay in the U.S. But after you get those things, yeah, 
go to a place where you're an unusual commodity. So let me ask you, let's step back for a second, because I want to go and get your opinion on other places like Brazil and India and so on. But what what is the reason an American, so let's say an American goes, yeah, Doug, I agree. I'm provincial, but who cares? I like where I live. I think it's the greatest, you know, okay, let's, let's, I'm going to play devil advocate. Somebody says, okay, Doug, you're right. We're a global empire, but the world's been populated by empires for the last, I was just reading about the Cambodian, you know, the, the empires, these are from the six, 700s, the Viking empire in the 800s. So what? We're an empire. We're not that bad relative to, you know, the Roman Empire or others. What's another more selfish reason you might want to leave the U.S.? Are we talking, you know, 100-year cycle? My grandma was born in 1918. She lived through two COVID-type events. The first one was in in 19. She was born in February 19. 1918 world war one was still going she died sadly at 102 in june uh sorry may 2020 so alan nation one of my mentors joel south mentor used to say ty things work in 100 year cycles approximate 100 years so 100 years not too far away from 100 years ago was 1929 massive depression so do you think there's evidence of a coming depression is there evidence of some tyrannical rule where governments are going to overstep their bounds in the United States beyond where it is now? Is there another re- is it just pure opportunities better and America's too competitive? So before we get into why, you know, Africa, Brazil, what's the strongest reason specifically in your opinion to consider diversifying whether it's 100% out of the US or 50% or 30? Well, It's a mistake to stay in one place. That's a good strategy for a potted plant, to stay in one place, to have roots and not go anywhere. But it's not a good strategy for a human being. Mm. So that uh, you don't want to act like a medieval peasant who's afraid to leave his local village because there might be dragons over the next hill. Uh, you owe it to yourself to expand your horizons as far as possible. And having seen everything, then you should choose the place that suits you best. It may be the place that you're born, where you have friends and experience and, you know, the culture, or it may not be. Uh, So, but you want to, you want to allow yourself that option. So number one reason is it's just logical that there's more. I always say many great ideas if you're an entrepreneur. Red Bull came from a man who traveled a lot. I forget his last name, Mattishitz or something from Europe. He was traveling Southeast Asia. He read about this drink, Red Bull. He brought it to Europe, became a billionaire. Nike, Phil, you know, Phil Knight, uh, I think that's his name. Yeah, Phil Knight. He was traveling, saw a shoe company no, in Japan. No, that, actually, there were a couple of guys who were related. One founded Adidas and the other founded Nike. That's the way okay. I, I yeah. wasn't there. But, but, but the, yeah, whatever the, I, I slipped in my mind, shoe dog, there's a book about it. He was traveling, saw this Japanese shoe. So just pure, like you said, it's a mistake to stay in one place because your provincial mindset, you're competing against other people in the U.S., who think very U.S. focused, go get ideas. Starbucks was an Italian, uh, an idea by the founder who was in Italy and saw these little cafes and he brought them. Okay. So that's a rewards based reason. That's a positive reason. Get out. What's a pain. Do you think the U S with, for example, the inflation we see in the U S with the debt, with the printing of money, with the rising conflict, polarization of Republicans versus Democrats. Right now I'm in Scandinavia. I was talking to a Danish friend yesterday and they're like, I can't, we have eight parties here. I saw I was in Norwegian friend. They're like, we have eight parties. It's insane that the U S has only two. It polarizes too much. So is there a potential coming civil war of sorts? 
Is there nuclear attack and people need to learn off the land? What do you think is the highest probability negative catastrophe that will happen to people in the U.S.? What's the Nobody knows the future. What do you consider the highest probability semi or fully catastrophic event that could happen specifically will affect Americans? Well, I'd say number one is the economy. Uh, and the currency in the U.S. One of the reasons why the U.S. Look, the reason why the U.S. has been as successful as it has been since its founding is it's been, generally speaking, the freest of all mm -hmm. countries. It's been the country which has most characterized Western civilization as a whole, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom for com commerce, low taxes, freedom of trade. Uh, those things are all going by the boards at this point. A uh, hundred years ago, the government uh, lived on import duties and excise taxes. That was it. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, we have an income tax that takes, let's say, 50% of your income. We have Social Security taxes, all kinds of layers of taxes, which pay for a gigantic bureaucracy, which regulates you, tell you what you must do, what you may not do. So in other words, Americans like to think about uh, themselves as being the land of the free, but we're not. Mm. Uh, we're highly regulated. Most people are unaware of the fact that the United States is the only major country in the world that if you leave it and you never come back, you're obligated to file a tax return yes. to the U.S. every year. And pay, for and pay full taxes unless you have an offset credit. <clears throat> There's two countries in the world. I think it's Kenya is the second one. <laughs> U.S. in like Kenya, some African, but effectively just the U.S. It's insane. Yeah, it's, um, it's Eritrea, actually, in oh, Africa. Okay. But um, a, a lot of countries are, are moving in that direction. But um, I, I guess the point that I'm making is, is that um, there are a lot of advantages to being a foreigner in a foreign country. And you, you tend to be below the local government's radar. Uh, you're a non-person. You're a possession of another government which right. tends to give you a little bit more freedom. But I'm very concerned um, with the uh, U.S. economy uh, at this point. Uh, inflation, which is caused by, it's not the fault of the butcher or the baker or the gasoline maker. It's uh, a creation of central banks and government spending. It's getting completely out of control. The U.S. as a, both a government and individuals and corporations very deeply in debt. Um, one of the reasons why the U.S. has done relatively well, since even since it got off the gold standard in 1971, is because our major export has been dollars, and that's pretty. That's been pretty good because you uh, you uh, export dollars at essentially zero cost and. The nice Germans send you Mercedes and the Japanese send you Sonys and so forth. That's a pretty good deal. But at this point, there are, we don't really know how many trillions of dollars are floating around outside the US. Yeah. And especially with this war uh, in the Ukraine, where uh, the US government has confiscated Russian government assets, not just the government's assets, but those right. of individual Russians, a lot of people increasingly are asking themselves, you know what, uh, the dollar is a hot potato. And by owning dollars, all of which have to clear through New York, uh, if I'm on the wrong side of the US government, they can be taken away from me. Yeah. So people are trying to get away from, look, people are afraid of the US. It's not a question of loving the US anymore. The old days with California girls and um, and rock and roll music and and, and convertible cars, and that's all gone. Yeah, People now see the U.S. as um, as a military power. We have 800 bases in foreign countries around the world. Yeah. And uh, 
the locals don't see these American soldiers as friendly G.I. Joe liberating them the way they were in, let's say, France in World War II. They see them as an invading, heavily armed, and dangerous foreign power. So um, now everything's changed, and I don't think Americans are aware of it. The, economy's, no. the economy is slipping away right from, from under us. Look, I think we're looking at a, fan, at a very deep depression. Um, I call it the greater depression. And what's a depression? It's a period of time when most people's standard of living drops significantly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, that's actually been happening uh, slowly for, for some years, but it could become catastrophic. Start out with a financial collapse, goes into an economic collapse, lots of bankruptcies, personal, corporate, and of course, the U.S. government is manifestly bankrupt, totally and absolutely bankrupt. Just the cost of food. I, I, that's why I have a farm. I, I just launched a new program called Amish Homestead, where I teach people, I call it the 11 laws of living off the land that I learned from living with the Amish for two and a half years. So I have the 11 laws and people are clueless on that. And so you just, I was just, <laughs> I'm in Copenhagen right now and I have some family visiting, went to a little place called Gasoline Grill. It's a well-known little hamburger joint and five people was $110 for hamburgers. I mean, that's, <laughs> it was like 25 bucks a person. Nobody even got French fries for hamburgers. And, the, and, you know, this rising cost of food, we're not talking inflation on travel, or, you know, we're talking, I was back in the US, where was I, Utah or somewhere, Whole Foods didn't have eggs for two weeks, they ran out, I mean, that's mine, America is the most bountiful piece of land on earth, you know, I do a lot with agriculture, in terms of you look at the latitude longitude range of the United States, the glacier soils, the limestone soils, uh, it's just mind blowing that the U.S. would ever run out of eggs. I mean, it, people don't realize how much, egg, how many eggs you can grow in a short period of time, in a short, uh, small land space. So let me, let me ask you this: crypto. Do you like crypto as a place for somebody to hold assets outside of any governmental? Now that's questionable. And if you do, is there a specific uh, coin that you like or strategy that you think is the safest for somebody to hold assets outside of or supposedly outside of the reach of a government? Well, as you're aware, there are about 20,000 or so coins that are out there. Uh, I see them mostly as trading sardines, not eating sardines. Uh, I was a late comer to crypto. I only got into it in 2017. Uh, why was I late? It's because, okay, these cryptos are basically used as alternate monies, alternates to the dollar, okay? Mm -hmm. And you've got to ask yourself, well, what makes a good money? Uh, and Aristotle defined five of the six characteristics uh, in the uh, fourth century BC, has to be durable. Yeah, crypto is durable. Has to be divisible. Yep, yeah, it is. Has to be convenient. That's why you can't use letters money. Uh, crypto can be convenient if you have a cell phone. Has to be consistent. One piece has to be like everything else. That's why you can't use artwork as money. And it has to have use value. And I couldn't see the use for just, um, it seemed artificial. But crypto is very good for transferring wealth because it's not crypto, but Bitcoin mm -hmm. and some other cryptos, like maybe like Monero might make it. But listen, you want to start with gold and then you want to start with silver. Yeah. And Bitcoin, I, I think it's going to succeed as an alternate money because, because it's... Um, its use value is it allows you to transfer money across borders. And especially in today's world, where 
governments have foreign exchange controls, including the U.S. incidentally. Uh, as you know, if you leave the U.S. or enter it, and, and most countries in the world, you have to declare if you have more than $10,000. Right. So crypto, Bitcoin in particular, helps you get around that. And I like Bitcoin in particular because the amount of Bitcoin is finite. You know right. what it is. Right, and that's not one million. True. Yeah, and, and, and that's not true of any of the others. So, yeah, I'm uh, listen, you can speculate in all these type of things, but uh, in today's world, it's important to, you know, build assets. You don't want to be penniless uh, in a depression. That's that's a bad scenario. So, for but with gold, let's take precious metals for a second. I've heard, you know, I like to hear both sides. I've heard both sides. One of the practical questions for gold or silver is where do you store it? Where's the safest place? You know, are you an advocate of burying a hole in the backyard, getting a safe? Are you liking these? Some people want to invest in gold funds, or are you a fan of these different global uh, storage places that you can put gold, physical gold, and then you can, you got to get on a flight if you ever need it. What's kind of your preferred, or do you like a diversified approach? Well, first and foremost, uh, gold, which is about, what is it today? Uh, 1950, 1975, something like that. Browns, it's reasonably priced. It's not at giveaway levels. It's right. reasonably priced. Okay. Uh, so I don't see it as particularly good speculation at the moment. I think it's going higher very definitely, but it's not a good speculation. Um, you want gold because it's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. Now, hmm. your question was, where do we keep it? Well, the answer is, and I'm not trying to be cryptic, the safest place you can think of. Now, for some people, that might be a hole in the ground on their farm. Uh, but you also want to have your biggest risk today isn't financial. Financial risks are huge. Economic risks are huge. Your biggest risks are political. So you want to diversify politically. You want some of your gold and other assets outside of your home country, outside yeah. of the U.S. So you can store gold uh, safely and cheaply uh, in the Cayman Islands. There's a company there that allows that to happen. There's uh, Singapore. You can forget about Switzerland if you're an American because right. uh, Swiss banks don't want American business. In fact, almost nobody wants American business. <laughs> not, it's, not, it's not illegal for Americans to have an, an offshore brokerage account or an offshore bank account. But uh, try to find a foreign bank or broker that will take your business. It's more trouble right. than it's because of regulations in the U.S. to to uh, to have an American client. So uh, we're really like serfs. What was we're, the uh, name of the company in the Cayman Islands or Singapore? Do you remember? Yeah, well, in the Cayman Islands, it's called SWP. So okay. if you Google SWP in the Cayman Islands, uh, and that's physical storage of gold. You bring your gold there? Uh, no, they'll buy it for you there. You simply wire the money to them and it's stored. It's, and of can course, you, you can you go to, see it? Can you go get a key and yes. open it? Or Yes, okay. yes, you can. They have, they have a vault there. And I, I'm a big fan of the Cayman Islands. It's a sociologically very stable country yes. or colony, I should say. It's not independent, uh, it's a, a British self-governing colony. So uh, that would be one. Singapore would be another. I uh, can't give you a recommendation in Singapore. But if you Google these things, uh, they'll, they'll pop up. What about in uh, South America? You're living in any place you would store there? Well, there are private facilities, like here in Uruguay. Uh, there's a, an outfit called Fort Box in Punta del Este. Okay. Uh, and they have safe deposit boxes that you can rent privately, not part of a bank. Um, so I guess the point that I'm making is, if you're going to save, 
you don't really want to save with dollars because the dollar is losing value at five to 10 to 15% per year. I'm not sure what the numbers are. I don't trust the US government's numbers much more than I trust those of the Argentine government. Argentina is just across the river. <laughs> sir. Yeah, Argentina is not a good place to store anything. Well, maybe land you could own well, there. I own, I own a lot of land in Argentina, actually. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. By a lot, I mean, well, a bunch of stuff, but about 50,000 hectares, which is about 125,000 yeah. acres. Do you have Do you have it uh, farmed and, and managed by locals? Well, that's another problem. Uh, sure, the answer is yes, but uh, most of it's just raw land, not very good to farm. Like a partner of mine in that venture has another farm by himself, and he grows cattle on the farm. He's got about 100,000 hectares, 250,000 yeah. hectares. How many, how many cows can he put on 100,000 oh, hectares? Oh, God, I guess his bill's probably running three or 400. He calls them sand-fed cattle. If I was going to say, cattle, that's like that Australian really, ratio, horrible yeah. stocking ratio. If you have 100,000 acres or 300 cows, that's pretty wild. Not much water yeah. there or good yeah, water. exactly. Well, here where I am in Uruguay right now, um, well, sure. Oh, there you go. They have a lot of sheep in Uruguay. Uh, not on my farm, but... Um, but uh, but across the country, it's a massive sheep and cattle, or at least it used to be. The yeah, wool markets are weaker now. You know, when I first got into the cattle business, and I partially partially grew up on a farm well, when I was a kid for, for a few years, it, it seemed pretty obvious to me that uh, every, every year, a mama cow has a new baby cow. Right. And then after a couple of years, the baby cow... You, you sell off the little boy cows to uh, get cash flow. And then the, the new mama cow becomes, and she has babies and it's exponentially right. compounding. And of course I found that it really was, there was a lot more to it than that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's more to it. They're, they're not automatons. So you have to take care of them. So let, let me ask you this. What about, We've talked a little bit about Africa. We've talked about gold, silver, Bitcoin, the U.S. What about buying operating businesses or operating your global business from foreign countries? Are there countries you would set up an LLC in uh, besides a U.S. country that you found, you know, are advantageous jurisdictions? I mean, people used to do it in Cayman Islands. People used to do it in you know, the various islands, uh, the Channel Islands in the, in uh, the, off the United Kingdom, what's kind of for operating a business, maybe an online business, any foreign countries that you think are the best for people to consider? Well, look, if you're going to run an online business, you can be anywhere that has a good internet connection. And almost every place in the world at this point has a good internet connection. Yes. Uh, the main consideration, and of course, a lot of this is obviated if you're an American, because we talked about the fact that Americans have to pay taxes no matter where they are. But not all your listeners are Americans. I mean, you're quite international. No. Listener but even if you are American, you can operate. You can have. I have American friends that have businesses in Dubai, and they have them in Estonia, and they have them in Hong Kong. You know, and and they they diversify that way. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's quite correct. And the key there is not to spend more than six months of the year as a general rule in any country. Because yeah. if you spend more than six months of the year in the country, then you become uh, an official resident and you're then within that country's tax net. Yeah. So it's better to have a, a warm place in the winter and a cool place in the summer. And you just go between one and you take your computer with you. Yes. So that's very, you know, one of the nicest places to live in the world. I mean, it is basically what it comes down to. If you have computer and the knowledge base, well, in the Orient, I'm a big fan of Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a unique country. Um, in South America, 
Oh, I'm, a, I'm still a big fan of Argentina, <clears throat> which is okay. probably, well, it's certainly one of the cheapest, it's probably the cheapest and nice country in the world right now. It's, okay. it's so inexpensive, you literally wouldn't believe it. Even um, better than even better than Thailand, do you think? Yeah, well, they're different, but put it this way. If you can live in Buenos Aires, it's like living in Paris, except right. the cost of everything yeah. from renting a place to having a meal is probably 20% of what it is in France, I'm know. guessing. That's going back to that Tim Ferriss, you know, four hour work week concept of income arbitrage. So you set up in Thailand, you set up in Argentina, you know, you set up globally and you make money in maybe American dollars with your online business and then you spend money. I mean, Argentina, one of my best friends is from Argentina and he's like, Ty, if you look at trying to have a nice place in Europe or the United States, let's say you're renting, trying to give a nice place in Hollywood, 10 grand a month. He's like in Buenos Aires, you can hardly even find a place that expensive. He's like, I don't even know how you rent a $10,000. You can get a penthouse. I was just in Sao Paulo. You can get an amazing penthouse for four to $5,000. I mean, the cream of the crop in the Beverly Hills type area. So I love, I think more people should take advantage. It, even if you don't think America is going to end, it's like income arbitrage, you know, income slash spend arbitrage. Well, you're quite correct. And uh, you can actually be paid to live in these various different countries. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I lived in Spain. We lived in Spain on the Costa del Sol. Uh, bought a really beautiful apartment in a really beautiful developer. It was a penthouse apartment, apartment very near the ocean. And uh, Spain became popular at that time and it doubled in value. So by the time we left Spain, it was worth twice what we paid for it. Wow. We were paid to live there in effect. Yeah. Uh, we moved to New Zealand. I went to New Zealand for the polo. And at that time, New Zealand was, well, probably the cheapest nice country in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the real estate we bought there doubled or tripled in price. The currency at the same time doubled in value against the dollar. So we were in effect paid to live in New Zealand. And uh, so th th this can be done if you choose your country wisely. And right now, if you're looking to pull that off, I'd say Argentina is your best choice. Mm -hmm. uh, things are finally going to change in Argentina, I think. Um, there's a, uh, a a fellow who's running for president of Argentina, and um, he's very radical. He's an ANCAP. Oh, really? And the people huh. love him, especially the young people. Yeah. And he might be elected. And if, if he's elected, I mean, it could turn out that Argentina goes from being, you know, a, a very nice basket case to, uh, you know, a, one of the most prosperous countries in the world. So I, I would say if somebody wants to diversify internationally right now, a good shot, both for very low cost of living currently and very large upside potential with property is Argentina. That's fascinating. What do you do for a living? Do you make a, <laughs> is, is this your living being a- um, No, talk show no, I'm not. Show? I started about 10 years ago. I mean, I've done many different things, but I'm an entrepreneur. Um, 10 years ago, I was one of the first people to really start doing online business education. So I did do that, have a lot of different courses that I sell kind of like masterclass, you see a company like that. Um, mm -hmm. I also buy companies. And um, so I'm pretty diversified entrepreneur, um, do a lot. I There was a time when I was really focused on social media, grew to about 10 million social, eight to 10 million social media followers, hundreds of my YouTube channel has been viewed, I think 2 billion minutes watched of my videos. So, but I've always, you know, I've been an entrepreneur. Um, I'm pretty diversified. I've got a book club. I, I do a lot with, you know, talking about farmland. I talk about what I call the seven pillars of the good life. You know, so we talk about health, wealth, love, happiness, all these things that you need to really live a good life. So, 
yeah, sometimes people have a hard time describing what I do, but I also buy companies, sell companies, start new companies from scratch. I own some big companies out there that people know. And um, so, yeah, I'm all over the place. But one of the things, I'm a big fan of global living. I've been doing that, you know, for a long time. And I'm even now I'm I'm very global um, and and kind of rotate through five or six countries on a back to the U.S. where I have my farms and 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 office in Miami and come you know I used to be based in L.A. but I I, I became well known just for video blogging my life every day I would post what I was doing as an entrepreneur my lifestyle this is when I lived in Hollywood and Beverly Hills and so that's when I really that's what a lot of people know me. Um, but I was an entrepreneur from a teenager. So I've done the grass fed beef business with Joel Salatin. That was my first business. Um, and I've owned nightclubs and I do restaurants and hotels. And so I, I'm, I'm an explorer, you could say, which reminds me. So let me ask you, let's do a, what I call rapid fire opinion session. So just kind of getting your, I'll, I'll kind of, 20 second answers. We'll just go fast. I want to talk about your opinion on different countries and just kind of get a quick blurb and then we'll just move on kind of rapid fire. Sure. Sure. So Brazil, what's your thoughts? Good and bad. Your 20 second you know, version. You know what they say about Brazil? It's the country of the future and it always will be. Um, <laughs> Brazil really is one of those countries that eventually is going to break up into two or three or more countries. Certainly the Northeast is going to separate from the, uh, from the Southern part. Um, I like Brazil a lot. Uh, so it's. Uh, and would you give the, it a thought? Would you give it a thumbs up for a place for people to explore and potentially, uh, you know, set up some yeah, of their life very, and business? Very, very much. And of course, when we look at South, well, most countries of the world, uh, especially the third world, so-called countries, uh, politics is a big part of it. And uh, they reelected Lula, who was a socialist and basically yes. a, a kind of an avuncular criminal, if you would, uh, <laughs> replacing Bolsonaro. Uh, so it's, it's going to go through a tough patch. But yeah, I'm, I, I'm a fan of Brazil. All right. While we're in South America, Latin America, what's your thoughts on Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico, my heart's devotion. Let it slip back into the ocean. Uh, <laughs> that's what Maria's friend sang in West Side Story, you'll recall. Yeah. Um, Puerto Rico is kind of like two worlds since they had their their these two articles, 20 and 22, you can and basically- 60, yeah. Inherit, yeah, you can basically live tax-free as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur in Puerto Rico. You just have to be there six months of the year. Right. So that's why I'm not in Puerto Rico. Uh, um, it's fine. Yeah, it's it, just you it, gotta be, you have, to, you have to be there a lot. That's the key. What about Mexico? What do you give Mexico? My mom's a huge fan of Mexico. What's your thoughts? Is it a thumb up or sideways or down? Mexico used to be the land of the Frito Bandito, but uh, things have uh, things have improved and changed in, in, in Mexico. And uh, I mean, I was I'm very impressed uh, when I get down there. In fact, in, in Mexico City, I was there a year ago and uh, I had an accident, very bad accident uh, on my uh -oh. left foot. And I had an emergency operation in Mexico City at a hospital in Chapelco. And it was superbly done, reasonable mm -hmm. cost. Huh. Mexico is a fine place to live. Let's switch to, to, let's switch to Europe, Scandinavia, thumbs up, thumbs down, sideways as a place to live or do business for a global nomad. Uh, you know, Europe in general is stultified, constipated, regulated, <laughs> high taxed, uh, and heading into more troubles because um, as the going gets tough in the future, and listen, listen, Scandinavia and all of Europe, 
frankly, um, it's going to suffer massive, massive migration from mm. the global south. If I was a young Nigerian, I would somehow get to Europe. Right. Well, why not? I mean, free food, free cell phone, free money, vastly higher standard of living. Yeah. They're going to, uh, Europe is going to have many, many millions of feet people and boat people invading it from the Middle East and from uh, Africa in the years to come. Um, and if you live in Europe, you're going to get caught up in the tax system. It's crowded. Look, Europe's a nice place to visit. Personally, I wouldn't want to live there these days. What, so let's take outside the EU, Schengen, EU type countries, the Romanias, the Belarus, well, maybe not Belarus, but, or even the Balkan, you know, the Balkan, Serbia, Croatia, or, you know, the Estonia, Lithuania, any of those places, do, or do those fall, in your opinion, just into the European category? Look, I don't know how this stupid war in the Ukraine is going to work out. And yeah. when we're talking about Eastern Europe. That is uh, a consideration. Yeah. Uh, what is NATO going to do relative to Russia and all those countries that are on the front line, as it were? Uh, I was in the Ukraine like, uh, I don't know, six years ago and um, met a fellow there, an American, entrepreneurial, who was buying, uh, you know, rundown but nice townhouses in okay. Kiev and fixing them up uh, in, the American, that, in the American yeah. manner and renting them for you know a very good buck and then selling them to diplomatic types okay. for a bigger buck. I think he had a great business and he was raising money so he could buy several townhouses at once and expand the business. And I almost went into that with them. That would have been a big mistake, Ooh. turned out. Yeah, I've so, always told people, a lot of the global people, I've, I've, I know some of them, and they were big on Ukraine. And I always told them, I said, ah, you got to factor in externalities like Putin invading, you know, and, and people forget war has been a big creator of wealth, but also a robber of wealth and in the case of the ukraine it was it was unfortunately probably inevitable that something like this happened it's been happening it happened in the 1940s too you know well it's happened you know ukraine that translates that word translates into borderland yes and it's been a place where you know armies like uh conan the barbarian type things have been running back yes. and forth across it for a thousand years yeah. Uh, is that going to change anytime soon? Uh, doesn't seem that way. Yeah, Poland had that problem. Romania have always been the Turkey has been on that kind of frontier between the East and West. Let's switch for a second here in this kind of rapid fire. Australia, what's your thoughts? Well, during the recent COVID hysteria, uh, they were severely locked down. Yeah. They were one of the worst countries. One yeah. problem. Second problem is. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, Canada, and the U.S. are what they call the Five Eyes countries, all under the th thumb of the U.S. Um, used to be, you know, it used to be a, a real land of opportunity, but um, I don't think so anymore. Uh, all right. So we'll give it a thumbs, maybe a thumbs down in this context, even though I love Australia in your context. What about Dubai? Dubai is a big question mark. You're in the Middle East. It's opened mm. up with, you know, no taxes or very low taxes. It's a hub between Asia, Europe, Middle East. Where, where, what's your thoughts there? First time I went to Dubai was just going through the airport. And the airport back then, uh, early 80s, a was a dump, and B was about the size of the airport in Aspen, Colorado, where I lived. Okay, yeah. So the place is transformed totally and unrecognizably. It is absolute. That place, that place is science fiction. Um, yeah. 
The question is, is it sustainable? And I ask myself that question. Um, the problem is that it's right across the Gulf from Iran. Uh, I don't see Iran as being a problem for anybody but US politicians. Problem is that it's in the desert. And, right. uh, <laughs> it's like you know, Vegas. Yeah, and it's expensive to live in the desert. You're you're fighting the heat, you're fighting the sand. You've got to keep the place cool. Uh, great place to live. Uh, now it's, you know, wait until a disaster happens uh, mm. to buy an apartment. But uh, right now it's extremely expensive. Last time to have bought in Dubai was when people were leaving their BMWs and Mercedes in the garages and just getting out of town. Yeah. Uh, and and apart, apartments were very cheap. But now the place is booming. So uh, nice place to visit at the moment. But as a speculator, I I wouldn't do anything. I'd, I'd wait a few years until something bad happens. So, so we'll put that at, we'll put that as one of your thumbs sideways. What about in Southeast Asia? We talked about Thailand already. What about Cambodia, Vietnam, the Philippines? Any thoughts on those three or similar? You know, I love Southeast Asia and all those. All of, all of those countries that you mentioned are nice. And, and you could even say Laos, which nobody yeah. ever thinks about. Um, but what do you want to do? Do you want to live there or do you want to uh, look for entrepreneurial opportunities? Because I'm not sure where. I'm not sure where I'd look for entrepreneurial opportunities. I mean, 50 years ago, Import, export, and this type of thing was vastly different than it is today because communication was by mail and telex and very expensive international telephone calls. Now it's instantaneous. Everybody can do it. Everybody's looking for right. opportunities. So it seems to me those places should be mostly considered for digital nomads that have a yes. gig that they can do on their computer. And I like, I, I, I think all of them would suit for six months of the year because you don't want to yeah. get into the tax system. So we already talked about Africa at the beginning of the show. What about Colombia? I hear a lot about Colombia. Well, I've been down there five or six times over the years. And to a good part of Colombia too. And... Um, it really was violent. I mean, the first time I visited Bogota, it actually was a scary city. In fact, the last time I visited Bogota, it was scary because we had we had bodyguards and separate vehicles that were, you know, it's um, it's got a the trouble with Colombia is it's beautiful. And the, the problem is after World War II, they had something called La Violencia. Mm -hmm. And that was all about, you had, let's call them the liberals and the conservatives. The liberals yep. would, would ride into town. And if you were a conservative, they'd kill you. And then when the <laughs> conservatives rode into town, you're still they alive and you're a liberal and they'd kill you. And during this period, lasted for 10 years after World War II, a couple hundred thousand people died violently. Wow, yeah. And then since then, they got into the drug trade. I'm for 100% legalization of all kinds of drugs of whatever description. Because mm -hmm. when you legalize uh, things like drugs, it creates giant profit margins. And if right. you legalize violence and so forth. So that would, that would help to solve the problem in Colombia. But um, good know, luck have, for the U.S. I, I don't know that the U.S. is going to legalize everything. The U.S. is even it doesn't matter what the statistics are of legalizing. Now, they've legalized marijuana in most places. But as to hardcore cocaine and things like that, that it'll have to be another generation before that current generation dies and a new generation <laughs> starts probably. up. I, well, we both hope that they legalize all of these drugs, of course. But uh 
unlikely to happen while the DEA is in existence because I suspect most DEA agents expect to retire multimillionaires. Oh. Really? You think? Super see, I'm, yeah. I, I have mixed feelings on whether I think you should legalize some. I'm not sure about, I have a brother who's a heroin addict. I'm not sure if, you know, so I'm on the fence. I know you're for legalizing everything. I, I tend to be a, Aristotle talked about, you know, the middle way, Buddha, the middle way, or the, the mean in the middle. So I tend to think, yeah, I, Joel Salatin is more like you. It's like pretty much get rid of the government well, everywhere. Yeah. Look, as you're well aware, when drugs are illegal, it doesn't stop people from getting right. them. All right. it does, all it does is put a lot of profit in the uh, arbitrage between where you can get them and where you can sell right. them. No, they ought to be easily available in um, in the local drugstore. But uh, something like people... heroin, it's so addictive. Like my brother got addicted to when he's 14. No, well, look, alcohol. Yes, al alcohol is addictive. Tobacco is yeah. addictive. Oh, for sure. Look, I, I mean, I think if it was more logical, you should also include, you know, cigarettes and alcohol in the same kind of regulatory framework. So it is definitely bizarre to me well, that in Scandinavia... Is, uh, yeah. How is this your business, what other people do with their bodies? Your primary possession is your own body. Right. And do you have a right to control other people's bodies and what they do? The answer is no, you don't, unless you believe right. they have a right to control what you do or don't right. do. So, you know, if somebody has these bad habits, it's because they have a bad moral character. Frankly, that's how they get into these things. So, no, it's none of your business. Or the, certainly not the government's business, because the government uses violence to to enforce these laws. So it, yeah. it, it makes the society itself being more violent. Look, there are a lot of people that have had bad habits, like Sigmund Freud uh, was a, a cocaine addict. Okay, yeah, He prescribed cocaine. He found the cure for depression. <laughs> it works very right. well in the short term. Well, well, listen, foolish, foolish on his part, okay? But it didn't stop him from being productive, okay? No, no How about no. sugar? Sugar is very addictive, yes. very destructive to people's physical health. You got to illegalize yeah. that. The market will solve these things and let people rise and fall to their own level. Yeah. Let me ask you, so two, two last questions as we wrap up. Number one, if you had to live in the United States, for some hypothetical oh, I do. reason. I do part of the year. I do. But but let's say somebody had to base their, where where do you like right now? Are you like in Florida because of the no state tax? Are you a California person, Seattle, Wyoming, Vegas, Texas? What's kind of, if you had to pick a spot, where would you set up your base? Well, I like to be around people that I share a worldview with. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would tend to put me in a so-called red state. Okay. Uh, just, just, just for that, just for that reason. But you know, I, I suspect that over the next generation, uh, the U.S. is going to destabilize, and we might have serious secession movements, mm -hmm. both a place like or certain counties in California breaking off. Uh, I wish Southern California would break off for the North. That would make me happy. Let the sure. North be the North. They're kind of insane up there. It, well, politically. It, exactly. And the farming areas of California have nothing to do with right. either LA or San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, sure. That's an, entirely possible that uh, the U.S. is going to <clears throat> break up into uh several at least semi-autonomous regions and it's not going to be pleasant because the last time that was attempted in 1861 yeah. it didn't that was a big deal <laughs> so um, so red state so you're thinking a florida a you know a florida texas something like like this a red state yeah a, a, a southern wyoming, state but wyoming has has other problems those windbone windbone plains unless you're around Jackson Hole, which is ultra expensive. Um, listen, I I spend time in Virginia because yeah. I partially grew up in Virginia. And now that I'm getting older, it's like a salmon swimming upstream, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> so let I me ask you this. Rural part of Virginia. 
Let not, me ask not, you. Not within the Washington Beltway, which yeah, is not. That's one. that's not that's not <laughs> that's not Republican by any means. So let me ask you this. I like to end with this question. Uh, let's say you were decided you're going to go on one of Elon Musk's spaceships, go to live on Mars, and this is your last interaction with humanity, with humans. You're going to leave a letter for your family, friends, and so on. A short letter on anything, your life advice to those you leave behind that you've learned in your lifetime. What is that one paragraph? Let's say you only had a paragraph to write. What, what do you say, your life wisdom to that group that's remaining by uh, behind here on planet earth yeah well i'd say keep your pecker hard and your powder dry and don't take it seriously because this is all just dust in the wind you live on a planet with crazy chimpanzees so if i was going to another planet uh like mars which would have its own problems <laughs> listen there there is no there is no uh, simple advice. I mean, philosophers have tried to give it for thousands of years, and uh, what have people learned? Approximately nothing. But <laughs> any, wis any wisdom that I do have to uh, to uh, impart uh, is in the books I've written, and I would direct your attention to the novels that I've written. Have you seen those, Ty? I've seen some. I've seen more of the nonfiction books. I'm going to put some links in the show notes to, to grab. You have, of course, your very famous kind of book you wrote that I read sold over 400,000 copies. But yeah, we're going to put a link, link to your website in the show notes, your books. And I hope to do this call again. Maybe we'll do a Zoom when I'm down in South America. We can meet in Buenos Aires and do a in-person show. I think, you know, this question that I just asked you, I think my short answer to the world was there was a professor. If I was leaving and going to Mars, I would sum it up with there was a professor in the 60s who summarized Charles, Charles Darwin. And he said, it's not the smartest or the strongest who survive, but it's the most adaptable to the environment in which they find themselves. So I would say be adaptable and be a learning machine. And that is your best chance to live the good life here on Earth. And um, so this was a great show. I appreciate you coming on and I look forward maybe to be being there in South America with you. And, and uh, yeah, I'm going to put the show notes at tylopez.com slash podcast, Doug Casey, D-O-U-G-C-A-S-E-Y. tylopez.com slash podcast, Doug Casey, all one word.